My name is Jim Plush, Senior Director of Engineering at CrowdStrike, and co-presenting with me today will be Dennis Opaki, our Senior Cloud System Architect. So just a quick intro on CrowdStrike and so you get a sense of how we use Cassandra, what kind of data we're working with. So CrowdStrike's in the next generation endpoint security market. So essentially picking up where AV has failed, uh, doing a lot of real-time detection, indicators of attack, indicators of compromise, a lot of uh, machine learning models on the back end to determine potential threats for our uh, customers. We are a cloud-based uh, endpoint technology company, which essentially means we have a small uh, kernel driver that sits on different operating systems and servers, desktops, laptops, and these systems are connected up to our cloud system and are constantly sending telemetry up, things like process execution, DNS queries, uh, internet IP connections, uh, lateral movement detection, all this sort of machine data that has to get processed in near real time to try and you know, outpace the ability to, uh, for the attacker to get the upper hand. So given its machine data, and especially on things like servers, a single large enterprise customer can generate up to two terabytes of this raw data per day that has to get uh, processed as fast as possible. Right now we're seeing about 500,000 events per second hitting our production uh, Cassandra cluster that is actually running on, on EBS. Um, and just within uh, our network, we have multiple petabytes of data under management. So what this talk is really about is about breaking down uh, a truism, like a truism um, that's been out there about EBS and Cassandra. And there's a lot of those, right, in engineering that are sometimes lore that you know, people get in their heads and they think, well, this is how it is forever. Things like HTTPS is too expensive to run everywhere, right? With the advancement in on-chip crypto, you know, you see companies like Facebook and Google, they're rolling HTTPS uh, out across their entire stack with really no performance penalties. Uh, things like all you need is antivirus, right? Tell that to Target and Sony now. That's not generally the case. And something applicable to this crowd is never run Cassandra on, uh, on EBS. It's in the data stacks documentation forever. It goes back to 2011 that they say, you know, never run on EBS. It's, you know, in the community. If you even mention it in IRC, they'll kick you out of the channel. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's got a really bad rap in the community. Not, not for, you know, invalid reasons, perfectly valid reasons. So just the level set on EBS, just to make sure we're all talking the same thing. Um, think of EBS as a network-mounted hard drive, right? You, it's a separate service outside of EC2. We're able to provision a data volume, attach it to a running instance. You could stop an instance. You can reattach it to another instance. Gives you a lot of flexibility, uh, including things like native support for in-flight and uh, encryption at rest. So some of the issues in the past with EBS, which, which were valid at, at one point, were the jittery I.O., right, noisy neighbor problem. Netflix jumps on your box, all of a sudden, you know, your performance drops because they're hogging all the, uh, all the bandwidth. Um, it was a single point of failure in a region, right? With, with Cassandra, you want to replicate your data across availability zones. If one AZ goes down, you lose all three copies of your data. Well, that's not much fun. Um, cost was always a factor. And I get all this free ephemeral disk. Why do I want to pay for EBS? And now we're seeing the move uh, within EC2 that they're going more into the EBS direction and you're getting less ephemeral choices. And then there was the old bad volumes. Right? I'm going to spin up 10 volumes. I'm going to run DD. I'm going to run FIO. And I'm going to pick the one with the, the best consistency and throw the rest away. So we had a recent project come up that forced us to take a look at EBS again. And we were in the same camp. You know, when we first started with Cassandra, we've been running it for uh, almost four years in production. And we were, we were on ephemeral uh, instances, and we followed the same pattern, like EBS, no way, not on our Cassandra cluster. Um, and Dennis will, will touch on that in a little bit. But this project that came up forced us to reevaluate the EBS story with Cassandra, because what we essentially wanted to do is build a large distributed graph of all this telemetry we're collecting so we can do some you know, more advanced analysis and uh, more advanced detection capabilities. And 
given this amount of machine data, we're modeling it out to be about a petabyte, um, just at current, current levels of scale and needing to scale well past the, uh, the petabyte range for a Cassandra cluster. We also needed something that could at least handle, you know, two to three X the current traffic uh, so we can grow into it. So it had to be able to handle a million writes per second, being able to build this, this graph. We needed to age out data really crisply. You know, in Cassandra, when you delete data or TTL it, uh, it doesn't actually leave the disk until it, it gets compacted out and the tombstones uh, align with that data. So we needed to be really clear and crisp on when that data was actually leaving disk uh, and also reduce the IO and write amplification problems with really dense nodes and, uh, and heavy delete IO operations. And we were heavy, heavy write to read, so we really need to focus on write performance. So early on, um, we didn't want to rebuild the wheel. We said, what's out there already that we could you know, build this big graph on? Uh, and there was Titan DB uh, over Cassandra. So we spent a couple of months working with Titan, working with their team, and trying to you know, build some prototypes in production with our data. And unfortunately, what we found was just, you know, it just wasn't, wasn't up to that scale um, for the kind of size workloads we had, the uptime requirements we had, and uh, the plans for future growth. So we had to kind of go back to the drawing board and look at, well, what are the other you know, sharding options we have? Can we you know, shard Neo for J? Uh, and unfortunately, you know, we, were, we were too big for um, even sharding uh, Neo for J um, after talking with those guys as well. So then we looked at, well, can we do you know, sharded adjacency lists over relational databases? So we looked at you know, Postgres, MySQL, we prototyped a bunch of uh, different workloads there. And then we started getting down into the level DB, rocks DB, uh, which are essentially you know, big table clones. And by that time, you know, we kind of just stopped and said, hey, we're, we're actually just rebuilding Cassandra here. You know, we're going to have to do our own replication. We're going to have to do our own you know, data movement and what happens in node failure and reshuffling data and resharding the data. So we really didn't want to be in that business. Um, so we said, can we make Cassandra work? And can we put enough time into tuning to actually get it to match our workload. So we came across uh, this great Netflix article on revisiting a million writes per second that they were kind enough to publish. And we really used that as a kind of a benchmark on you know, what would a one petabyte cluster cost with the kind of performance that we needed to see and what kind of hardware, like what do they recommend. And so when we dug into it, they're using the i2 extra large in this, uh, in this article. And that's ephemeral disk, 800 gig uh, SSD local store. Um, so really good performance. But when we modeled out, well, how, much, how many of those will we need for a petabyte of data? You're looking at 1,750 nodes, right? Assuming a 40% compaction overhead, which is a little more than any uh, cluster you want to run with Cassandra. Um, I think Netflix just released some information that they try and keep it under 300 nodes because of uh, you know, cross AZ latency. So this started causing us to look at the EBS story a little bit. And so we said, well, what would that look like with EBS and using C4 2XLs? And for that you know, same petabyte workload with 40% compaction overhead, if we ran four terabyte nodes, you know, denser nodes, we would need about 350, which is a more realistic size cluster. And you know, our kind of plans is to, is to pod those clusters. right? So we kind of have a few hundred uh, Cassandra clusters that we can route customers into. And when you look at the cost for that cluster, um, for that I2 on demand, you're looking at about $14 million, um, which would give our, our C-level execs a heart attack. Uh, even at reserve price, you're looking at you know, around $8 million. And when you look at the price for the C4 2XL reserved with EBS costs all in, you know, you're, you're well under $4 million. So significant savings uh, if we could have, you know, get EBS working with our, our workload. One of the other important uh, things that we thought we could get working with uh, Cassandra was the introduction of date tier compaction, which uh, is new in the 2.0 release. Um, one of my colleagues, Jeff Jersey, who's in the audience today, also did a great talk at Cassandra Summit a few weeks ago on it. It essentially allows you to do uh, time window compaction so we could say, hey, set a window for a day, and anything after a day, 
I don't want you to touch, I don't want you to compact it, right? So you're not paying that right amplification penalty. Since we have very, um, you know, uh, item potent, right once uh, type events that are never gonna be updated, they're just point in time, time series data, uh, we don't need to pay that compaction penalty for having to recompact those big files. So unfortunately, I won't go into too much detail, but it, it didn't work out as expected, and we had to have Jeff write our own uh, compaction strategy to kind of to kind of fix it. So um, feel free to grab us after to talk about it. <clears throat> so we started with the premise that you know we didn't want to run 350 nodes from day one, right? We want to be able to grow into that that 350, right? We're not going to have a petabyte day one. Why do we want to pay for a petabyte uh, day one? So we just you know picked it out of the air. Well. We should be able to do, you know, a million writes on 60 nodes, based on, um, you know, some benchmarks we were reading and some other posts, and everyone thought that was pretty reasonable. So we started out, did our data model, and we launched with uh, Cassandra 2.0. We just went with M3XL to see if we could make it work there. Uh, single 4T volume, which gave us about 10,000 IOPS, and just kind of the default tunings. Really, just a, hey, what can this cluster do? Uh, unfortunately, the results were just disastrous. Uh, she's not impressed. Um, we really only were able to push around 150,000 uh, writes per second at RF, what would be RF3 on a, a test cluster um, when you modeled out from 12 nodes. And it was just, you know, an order of magnitude less than, than we were expecting. So we started going through all the books and the blog posts, the videos, you know, how do we tune Cassandra? What are we doing wrong? and we just weren't able to move the needle, right? We're just like, we're just not good at tuning Cassandra. Let's bring in the experts. So we brought in Datastax, uh, we're a customer, and we did a three-day engagement with them. Day one was about validating our model, uh, and then day two and three, we wanted to talk about, you know, tuning this cluster. Let's get as much right throughput as we can. So day one went great, model looked good. Uh, we got into day two and three, and again, hit the wall. We weren't able to get any performance improvement we work with them. We had five engineers on a Hangout uh, for two days straight, trying different instance types, uh, different configurations, YAML settings. And at the end of the, the third day, still, you know, we got it up to about 200,000 um, on 60 nodes, but just way, way uh, slower than we were expecting. And we came across this, um, this post from last year's summit where Family Search seemed to go through the same problem that, you know, hey, uh, we're not seeing any bottlenecks, but I can't get any more throughput out of this Cassandra cluster. You know, where's the bottleneck? And that's what we thought originally, too. Um, when we first hit this bottleneck, we're like, oh, it's got to be EBS. This is why people don't run EBS. But when we actually profiled it, you know, IOSTAT, DSTAT, looked at our um, graphing charts, um, disk was completely bored. The volumes were way underutilized. CPU was fine. Network bandwidth was fine. Just couldn't get any throughput. So essentially, um, you know, we were started blaming EBS originally because you know the I2s have 43,000 IOPS and our lowly 4T volume has 10,000 IOPS. Like clearly, um, you know, it's an IOPS issue. But what we're actually doing is only about 1.3 thousand IOPS to that drive. So you know, and well under uh, 40 megabytes per second, and that volume should be able to push around 150 megabytes, 160 megabytes per second with the latest release. So very underutilized. So have all this, this IO available, um, but we're not able to, weren't being able to drive to it. So then we just went back to the drawing board and we spent the next two months really just digging in and, and really feeling like we could get it to work. Uh, so we just built this huge matrix of you know, different instance types, operating systems, YAML settings, configuration, kernel level, dirty page flush, uh, I mean, we, we tuned everything um, to try and to see what we could tweak to actually make that big breakthrough. And finally, uh, about two months in, we were able to find the magic incantation of, you know, uh, instance type and OS and file system and, and uh, all the JVM settings to actually uh, achieve that accomplishment. So. Before I get into what we actually picked, I just want to kind of go over the testing methodology we used, because we wound up spinning up, I mean, I personally spun up about 300 clusters trying various things, uh, so we put a lot of time into automating it. And just to, to head check there, because if you, know, you, you do improper testing, you may 
uh, be led to, to um, false results. So each test run we did was with clean instances. We dropped the old key space, really wanted a clean test run. Uh, we also wanted to load in plenty of data. So at RF3, 13 terabytes was a decent amount of data to make sure we were actually taxing the I.O. subsystem, right? During compaction, we wanted that, you know, wanted to, to see that contention between taking writes in and doing heavy compaction um, at the same time, to see all that limited throughput. And topology-wise, we tried to follow the, the Netflix topology uh, as best we could from their article, so splitting out the nodes across availability zones, using the EC2 snitch to balance uh, the AZs as racks, and then we launched separate uh, C4-4XL stress nodes. So we launched 20 of those in separate availability zones, and we had a dedicated op center so we can kind of monitor all this traffic. We also had a separate uh, graphing library um, also. We uh, actually went with two EBS volumes, so we split out the commit and the data drive. Uh, we never really saw the commit, even, even when we achieved our target, we never saw the commit log go uh, anywhere near really 3,000 IOPS. So we, we felt that uh, that was a pretty good buffer. We hit about, I think, 2,000 IOPS a few times on the commit log. So we picked a, uh, a 1T volume GP2 that gives us 3,000 IOPS. And notice that these are encrypted volumes too. So again, the performance penalty for encryption um, really isn't there with, with EBS either. We went with the uh, Cassandra 2.1 stress tool. Huge, huge improvement over previous Cassandra stress in 2.0 and, and earlier. Especially in 2.1.5, it gives you the ability to define your own YAML file, which really lets you model your workload in a realistic way. You can do Gaussian distributions over your data key sizes. Um, you can tune it to what you think your read and write workload's gonna be. Uh, you can put different stresses, you know, wide, very wide rows, very narrow rows. So it gives you a, a ton of flexibility there. I mean, documentation is poor, but once you get into it, it's, it's pretty impressive. Uh, another cool tool we used for testing was uh, PageCacheStat from Altobi at Datastacks. It's a really cool tool to let you know when your SS tables are expiring out of page cache, because what you don't want to do is you know, do a performance test and then realize that all your compaction is coming from page cache and coming from memory, and you're not actually pushing the I.O. subsystem at all. So you're not getting a true test. So you really want to kind of use this to make sure that you know, your SS tables for your data are actually expiring. So when the compaction happens, you know you're actually um, hitting that I.O. So we started with the, the same Netflix test from that paper. Uh, we added a little more data than needed, just to try and make it a, a little more realistic. But this is essentially like a zero to 60 quarter mile speed test, right? It's, it may not be indicative of your workload, but it's, hey, how fast can this cluster push bytes to disk? Um, so we essentially started around 350 writes per second, 1,000 writes per second, and then simulated a burst up to uh, 1.1 million writes per second, actually went around 1.2 and then throttled it back down. And what we wanted to see was let's, let's burst there for an hour Let's bring load back down to 350,000 writes per second, and let's see you know, how the cluster reacts to that. Uh, is it gonna fall over? Was it actually healthy at that point? So here's something you can view offline. The slides will be available. Uh, don't expect you to, to see it here, but just kind of look at the full op center picture. One of the key things we wanted to do with this test is make sure that, you know, hey, we hit a million writes per second, but the cluster fell over. Um, we, didn't want, we want it to be an actual you know, healthy cluster to a million writes per second. So across the entire cluster, we had no drop mutations, so no writes were getting dropped on the floor. Uh, all the systems were in a pretty healthy medium state. Uh, nothing out of memory, uh, nothing went into the red. So very, um, very good uh, consistent performance. On the I.O. side, you can see the commit drive on the top left here. Um, extremely consistent performance, right? None of the previous jittery I.O. that would typically affect uh, Cassandra on EBS previously. Uh, on the data drive on the top right, uh, probably can't see it, but data disk utilization, even during heavy compaction at a million writes, uh, well under 60% utilized and pushing you know, around 40, uh, 40 megs per second through that volume. And you can see uh, on the bottom left the, uh, the commit log, just, just super steady. I.O. weight. Very low IOA, consistent performance. Um, we're 
pretty impressed with the, uh, the response times. The 95th percentile latency for these writes, even at a million writes per second, 1.1 million writes per second, stayed, in the, uh, stayed under 15 milliseconds, which for our workload is, is uh, acceptable. And then we went to the read side. We're like, okay, let's, let's see how it is on the reads. So as soon as we turned on reads, we hit about 20,000 reads per second, and IO just, just, we just crushed those, that volume. Utilization just hit the ceiling, weren't able to push anything, uh, couldn't get more than 20,000 reads on 60 nodes. So we're like, aha, gotcha EBS. This is why no one runs EBS. Can't read your data. So what actually wound up happening is we discovered that um, we had uh, compression on, on the table with the default chunk size of 64K, which meant that for our little test where it's trying to read you know, a couple hundred bytes, it would actually have to decompress 64K, uh, best case, maybe across blocks 128K, just to get that 200 bytes and then throw the rest away. So extremely inefficient on the read side. So um, we wound up turning off compression and then changing our read buffer to 4K, uh, a lot smaller. And as soon as we did that, we were able to peak at a million reads per second on the same cluster and sustain 350,000 reads per second for over 24 hours uh, with you know, no, uh, no cluster fallover. And this was doing a 95% read to write ratio. And again, another kind of slide to view offline. And this shows the, uh, the 24 hour test of, of just hanging out around 350, 400,000 reads per second. And the nice part is now on the, on the charts, um, you can see the IO utilization was, was pretty steady. Now we're at you know, 60 to 80% utilized. Still plenty of headroom uh, on that system. Weren't you know, peg, uh, pegging it or taxing it. IO stat looked good, um, so much, much healthier. Latency wise, uh, the reads 7.2 milliseconds at the 95th percentile latency, so acceptable uh, for our use case. So how do we do against the Netflix cluster? Well, again, we were, we were optimizing really for, for cost. Um, so we use C4 4XLs, which are 16 core, so may consider that uh, some of an unfair test, but when you look at the cluster as a whole, you used 180 less cores than they did with their test. Uh, which is about 45 less instances. But more importantly to our test, it was almost a third of the cost, uh, which, was, which was key. So we got the same performance with a much, uh, much better price point. So on the read side, I mentioned we had a single uh, 10K IOP uh, GP2 volume. If you need more or bigger reads, you can certainly uh, raid those volumes together. You can use provision IOPs to get uh, more out of those drives. But you know, 10K is uh, about what we needed. So what unlocked performance? Major, major tweak we made was switching to HVM instances. Um, all our previous images were PV, and that was one of the huge reasons why we couldn't see that throughput increase, because we were actually gated on the network level. Um, so switching to HVM unleashed uh, a lot of performance gains from that cluster. Um, it's now faster than PV in almost every case. It comes with the, uh, we went with the Ubuntu distro, uh, 1404, that's uh, more optimized for cloud type workloads. And the XFS file system uh, gave us really great performance as well. We went with Cassandra 2.1. Uh, we've actually did this test with 2.17 and 2.19. Uh, both had the same, pretty much the same results. 2.0 was just, uh, I'll just be polite and say it was a dog. Um, just weren't able to get performance out of 2.0. We had other companies confirm the same when we tried to have them retest our results. Uh, so switching to 2.1, huge improvement in the right path. They did a lot of work around lock contention and a lot of work around having SS tables available right into page cache after uh, compaction. So big boost there. Um, Java 8 G1 garbage collector gave us really good uh, consistency with garbage collection pauses. So it brought down our 99th uh, and 90th percentiles. We went the C4 4XL, 16 core, EBS optimized for this test. Um, we're kind of predicting that we'll be at the C4 2XL as we expand out the cluster. 
uh, and have more nodes taking on uh, that data load. But for this test, we use the, uh, the C44XLs, which are EBS optimized. So essentially that means you have a dedicated pipe for EBS and you're not sharing traffic with the, the rest of the instance. And we went out with the, uh, the two volumes, as I mentioned. Heap size went with eight gig. Uh, due to the dense nodes we wanted to run, we wanted to make sure we had a lot of off heap uh, space for things like bloom filters and other indexes and things Cassandra keeps off heap. And as you had denser nodes, you need more of that memory available. Um, also wanted to make sure we had enough for, uh, for page cache. Get some, some magic sauce from Al from, from Datastax, uh, putting the process into batch mode to reduce some, some of the context switching and interrupts. Um, we masked off the zero CPU. So in some Ubuntu distros, uh, you can check your IRQ balance, but uh, the zero CPU is left for a lot of kernel interrupts, network traffic. So by masking that off, we were able to reduce a lot of the context switching uh, under high write load. I don't necessarily, maybe wouldn't run this in production normally, but we wanted to do a benchmark and we wanted to see how far we could push the cluster. YAML wise, um, this is pretty much all we really changed uh, from the YAML file. Again, we went with the EC2 snitch, which is available in there. Um, we did turn off internode compression. We actually found internode compression caused a lot of write slowdown because of uh, how much CPU it caused to compress and decompress the data on all the nodes with replication. So we turned that off. So some of the lessons we learned, uh, even though we thought we got EBS you know, a few times, EBS was never the bottleneck during our, during our testing. GP2 is actually legitimately ready for production workloads from a performance standpoint. Uh, Built-in types like list and map come at a huge performance penalty. We got a 30% speed boost uh, on writes when we switch from a map to a serialized uh, byte string. Um, so that was a, a big win. DTCS is very young. I probably wouldn't recommend it for, for production. Um, we do have another compaction strategy you can ask us about that's on GitHub that does what DTCS um, should be doing. Um, two one stress tool, again, is, is tricky to get your head around, but once you get it, it's really great at being able to model these workloads and really understanding how compression is going to affect your read path, right? Compression is great to minimize how much disk you're going to use, but then you have to look at, well, how am I going to read that back? How often, how fast do I need to read it back? Can I handle that decompression uh, CPU hit and IO hit? So the one thing we didn't want to do is just say, hey, you know, look at all the stuff we did, it's great. We really wanted to enable you guys to, you know, test your own profiles, test your own workload uh, on your Cassandra instances. So I wound up releasing all the Python Fabric scripts that I used to uh, automate um, how we brought up the clusters and change the configuration. Uh, it supports things like being able to run different profiles. So we have a C4 profile, an I2 profile. It'll do all the, you know, the rating and the file system format. We did a ton of other tweaks, you know, turning off swap and more than I can get into in the talk, but it's all, uh, all the details are in, in that repo. It allows you to, you know, launch nodes in a specific uh, AZ, bootstrap them again, which will install Cassandra and do all that uh, formatting for you to make it as, as fast as possible to test new configurations. You know, what does this look like if I change this, you know, current compactors? Uh, it supports multi-node support for running uh, stress. So one of the issues with testing stress I've seen is people bring up a bunch of stress writers and don't, uh, don't populate the sequence, so you're writing the same keys from all the files, so you're just doing updates instead of actual inserts. So this will um, support making sure you have uh, sharded uh, keys. So where are we at today? We are now three months on our EBS cluster. We've got hundreds of terabytes. Uh, loaded into it now. It's powering a lot of our applications, including our user interface. We've got billions of vertices and edges in the graph. And one of the interesting things is we're starting to change the perception based on the work we did around EBS and Cassandra. And just two days ago, um, Cassandra released an updated doc for planning EC2 clusters where now they are acknowledging that GP2 is ready for production workloads. So that lifts basically a four-year ban on not using EBS. So feel free to 
to uh, hit that link in the slides, and it'll uh, go through it. I would also recommend hitting Al Toby's guide for tuning Cassandra. This is a lot of work we did with Datastax. Uh, he's got a lot, a lot more detail on a lot of the system level tunings that we did and uh, the JVM tunings. And just thanks to all people at CrowdStrike and Datastax who, uh, who worked on this. So I talked about the performance side. And as you can see, based on our numbers and you know, the tools available, uh, you can see performance with EBS and Cassandra really is not an issue in, in the current GP2. So I'm going to pass it off to Dennis to uh, talk about the stability side of, of EBS. Great. Thanks, Jim. So the, uh, the work that Jim just presented represents a very significant investment, both in terms of engineering resources and cost to CrowdStrike. Uh, we spent uh, months of time, our most senior engineers working on this project, and it simply had to work, like Jim said, uh, because it really is the core of our network. We also spent over $100,000 in EBS and EC2 resources. So we hope that you guys can take something away from this and, and really take advantage of, of what we learned. One theme that Jim kept bringing up over and over in his talk was that, uh, aha, this is why people don't use EBS. It was both on the read and the write side. Well, this is a FIO run against a, a 4T 10K IOP uh, GP2 volume. You can see it's pretty steady. Looks good, right? So you have one little drop in there, but certainly not enough to affect uh, Cassandra. So we wanted to do a bit of a retrospective and understand why, why all the hate for EBS. And, I think it's clear the answer is it, haters going to hate. Well, CrowdStrike followed the crowd uh, with uh, using ephemeral and instant store uh, images. We, uh, we looked at EBS early on. We were building the production network, and, and we discussed it. And we talked about risk, and we decided that we, we just, there was just too much risk at the time. We needed to move with, with the tried and true. So we, we launched with uh, using entirely uh, ephemeral uh, root drives and, and put all of our data stores on, uh, on the ephemeral SSDs. We found it difficult and painful to start and stop instances. Uh, if we needed to resize something, that was a, a, a Herculean effort for us. Uh, we also couldn't avoid the big Amazon Palooza. You guys probably remember that affected about 10% uh, of our fleet. Uh, and finally, we're a security company, so we have to encrypt our customers' data both at rest and uh, in transit on the network. So we were doing shenanigans like uh, Lux and CryptFS. Uh, you know, you reboot a machine, and somebody's got to be there to type the encryption key in, or it just doesn't come up. Well, guess what? We still had failures. Uh, we still had machines go down. Uh, only now, guess what? You get to rebuild from scratch. So we wanted to understand why we had this uh, confirmation bias against EBS. And so we went and we dug back through uh, you know, what was going on in the news about the same time that, that we made the decision to not go with EBS. And April 2011 was really the defining moment for this decision uh, for folks to, to not use EBS. There was a, a big outage. Uh, I.O. became stuck on, on a vast number of volumes. And it, it really took hours, if not days, for companies to recover. Uh, it happened again in 2012 to a, a smaller extent. You know, some companies were affected by both outages, and then it happened again in, in 2013. Not, not good, right? Not a great track record. Really, the kiss of death, though, was that first outage. Am uh, Netflix came out with a, a series of recommendations following the outage, uh, and they all made really good sense, right? It was, uh, if you're going to run in the cloud, you need to be multi-region, so that if a region goes down, guess what? You're not entirely offline. Uh, they also introduced the, the chaos monkey, which I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard, of, heard about. It, it's kind of cool. That you, they just introduce random faults in, into the environment and see how it fails. And then finally, and unfortunately, they made the recommendation that if you want resilient uh, Cassandra databases, just stay away from EBS. And, and we did. Well, Amazon moves quickly and quietly. It was clear that they knew even before that April 2011 outage that they had a problem, that EBS really wasn't being treated or resourced as a first-class product within Amazon. So they, they made some changes, and I'll talk uh, in greater length about what those changes were. Uh, but then they started moving forward. They, they sort of got their things together, and they, they started moving forward and introducing important features. Uh, in July of 2012, they introduced provision IOPS. So this was uh, a, a means of using hard resource reservation on the back end to give you uh, guaranteed consistency. Uh, it was really cool, and, it, and it, it, it really got our attention, and we started using that for, uh, for some of our Splunk clusters. 
Uh, May 2014, this was, wow, this was a great day for us. This was uh, the introduction of native EBS encryption. So now we could get rid of the Lux and the CryptoFS and all of the shenanigans there. June 2014, though, was really the game changer. That's what got our attention for the rest uh, of our, our applications, uh, the GB2 volumes, where you're, you have both a, a guaranteed uh, uh, I.O. Uh, capability that's uh, proportional to the number of gigs of storage that you want to buy, uh, and then you're able to burst to a, a higher level. It was uh, 3,000 IOPS at the time. Uh, in the March of 2015, they, they raised, really raised the bar. You can now have 16 T volumes where maybe it was only uh, one T before, and you can now hit 10,000 IOPS on GP2 and 20,000 uh, on, uh, on PIOPS. All really great stuff for, for CrowdStrike, everybody. So let's talk about some of the changes that the EBS team made to, to get the product back on track. Um, the first thing they did was they stepped back and they said, we need to prioritize consistency and reliability of the product even above features and functionality. So things like native encryption, uh, GP2 and PIOps, those were all on the roadmap well before those outages. They put those, product, those, those products and features on hold and, and really got back down to the business of, uh, you know, how do we make this a product that people can trust again? They compartmentalized the control plane. So they removed cross-AZ dependencies for running volumes. Uh, what this means is that even if they lose an entire availability zone, uh, running volumes in the other AZs will continue to run unaffected by that. And that's, that's great. Uh, they simplified workflows to favor sustained operations. So whereas uh, certain failure scenarios would result in you know, as many as five steps in the workflow to, you know, to, to reattach a volume and make it work again. Now things just sort of tend to continue working, which is, I think, uh, as operators, what, what we expect and, and desire. They also did some pretty cool things around uh, formal uh, specifications and models. So uh, they, they put to use some work by a, uh, a renowned computer scientist, a respected computer scientist named Leslie Lamport, uh, TLA+. Plus. So this is a language for defining formal specifications. And it, once you've defined your formal specifications, you can do cool things like model testing. So you can define the, uh, the constraints of the system, uh, you can model it, and you can understand all the ways in which it can fail. Uh, and, and this helped them find uh, sets of, of uh, operations, uh, as many as you know, 15, 20 deep, that could lead to a failure. Uh, things that a, a human uh, SDT could never uh, really catch. Um, lastly, they, they, to this day, devote a, a large portion of their engineering resources to reliability and performance. They've, they have dedicated folks that really just focus uh, on ensuring that all the right things are being do, done so that we, uh, as operators, as customers, can trust the product. That, that's all really cool stuff. So how are they doing? Well, the EBS team internally targets five nines availability. Uh, and from our perspective, they're exceeding expectations. We're, we're, we're very happy. In the past 12 months at CrowdStrike, we've seen zero EBS-related failures. Uh, well, zero failures uh, of EBS is doing. We've, we've made our own failures. Uh, we have thousands of GP2 data volumes, approximately 2P of data, and we're in the pro process of transitioning all of our volumes, all of our, our uh, uh, instances to EBS root volumes. We, we've already moved all of our key data stores. We've moved our Splunk, we've moved our Cassandra, we've moved our Kafka. Uh, we've moved uh, Elasticsearch and Postgres all, it's all on EBS. And it's been, it's been good to us. This is a, a screen grab from the AWS status board uh, during the DynamoDB outage. Um, you know, we, we learned that day sort of what all the cross dependencies were within uh, Amazon products, how many of these things depended on, on Dynamo, DynamoDB. And, and you'll notice that uh, the EBS volumes were not affected. And, and we think that that's, uh, that, that really tells a good story for uh, reliability of EBS. So if you want to move your, your Cassandra workloads to EBS, what should you, you do to stay safe? Well, first, select a region that has more than two availability zones. This is primarily either, uh, if you're in the US, it'd be East 1 or West 2. Um, you know, we, we hear rumors there is a third AZ available in, uh, in West 1, but uh, uh, we don't seem to have access to it. Uh, use the EBS GP2 or PI app storage. Uh, there is uh, a magnetic storage option available as well. Uh, we're looking at that for some other applications. It, it seems pretty cool, um, but right now it's, it's not something that we're considering for Cassandra. Uh, Jim also mentioned separating uh, volumes for the commit logs and for the, the data. That, that just seems like a, a really good practice. 
What else can we, can we do? We can uh, use the CloudWatch monitoring knobs for EBS. So we can look for uh, IO pauses. We can look for uh, you know, running out of, uh, of burst tokens, uh, uh, all, all of those things, or boost tokens, all, the, all those sorts of things. Um, you notice pre-warming EBS volumes is crossed out there. This is another piece of folklore uh, in the cloud community. It used to be you would, you would start up your, your volumes. You would run, like Jim said, you'd run uh, Bonnie or, or DD or FIO. You'd pick the best ones. Uh, and then you would, you, know, you would just write to every block on the drive. And, and only then could you be ensured that you would have optimum performance. We don't do that. Uh, the EBS team tells me, that's, uh, tells me that's not necessary. So we don't plan to do that going forward. And we don't think you should either. Uh, use snapshots for backup, backups. Uh, before, what we were doing with uh, ephemeral drives is we would attach an EBS volume to all of our, our Cassandra servers. We would R-sync the data over to that EBS volume, and then we would snapshot it. So we were still using EBS snapshots, but we had to pay the I.O. penalty of that R-sync, and, and that, uh, we had a bad time. So most importantly, I think the takeaway take from this retrospective here is, is challenge assumptions. Uh, things change quickly in the cloud. You know, what was true yesterday, uh, what bit us yesterday, may not be true today. Stay current on the AWS blog, because that's where the changes are, are going to be announced. Uh, a lot of times, there'll be some cool new feature that's announced that's not available in your primary region. Uh, so you, you sort of shelve that and, and don't look at it again. Well, keep an eye on the blog. It's probably available now. Talk to your peers. Come to conferences like this. Uh, listen to talks. Understand what, what other folks are doing in your industry. Uh, and what assumptions they're challenging. There's a, a link down to the, to the bottom of the, for the EBS team if you, if you need more information. So even more importantly than all of that stuff, <laughs> we're hiring. If, uh, if the problems that, that Jim and I talked about are interesting to you, come talk to us. Uh, we, we would love to, to uh, have your help in, in spending the uh, 100 million we just raised from Google. So remember to complete your evaluations. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to, to Find us after the talk or, or at the bar later.